Okay, we're back. We're live. It's four o'clock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Global Connections. We're going global today with Jay Friedheim. We're going to talk about the fallout of the grounding in Suez of a ship called the Ever Given. It's the largest container ship in the world. It's a quarter mile long. And for what, about 10 days, it was stuck in the Suez Canal and there is fallout. So the first thing, Jay, you know about Admiralty and Maritime Law? What yeah, happened? I went, to, I went to school at Tulane. It's the world's leading Admiralty and Maritime Law School. So the kids that I went to school with and the ones that came after me wrote the contract for passage through the canal, wrote the contracts about shipping. Here's what we know. There's a ship called the Ever Given. But that isn't just enough. You need to understand that the vessel is actually owned by a company called Sosi Kisen Kasai, which is really a Japanese holding company. And it's leased. So the ship owner leases it to the Evergreen Maritime Corporation. The, the, uh, the actual Taiwanese, which is a Taiwanese-based conglomerate, the crew was hired by Bernhard Schutte Ship Management, which is a German company. So the people that work there, if this was an American ship and it was a Jones Act question, then they would only be allowed or they would, they would be allowed to sue their ship, their, their, the person that hired them, which is a German company. Now, here's what's really exciting at the moment. And that's that Egypt filed a lawsuit in this little bitty town along the Suez Canal. After that, the company filed a lawsuit called the Limitation of Liability, and they did it in a British a court. So the way the limitation of liability works is the place that was filed first gets to control the case. And then there's something that's called a concorsus, which means everybody has to come to that little court to decide the matters. So the biggest initial dispute is, is Egypt going to honor the British's claim that even though their suit was filed later um, and have the Egyptian rights decided in in uh, Britain. And uh, I would just say the likelihood that the Egyptian nation has any concern for the interests of Britain, which seized control. The history of this is fascinating. Um, there was an invasion by Britain, France, and Israel in which they tried to come and take back the canal after Nasser nationalized it for very good reasons. There's fascinating history related to the canal. Yeah, well, let me back up a little bit and just confirm that the ship, it takes about a day, rather 12 to 14 hours for a ship to navigate the canal. The ship got stuck. I want to ask you what happened there. And as a result, some 360 ships uh, were, were stuck behind that ship. They couldn't go through the canal. And that's, that time is huge money. The claim that the Egyptian government is asserting is $900 million. They have not said exactly what that's about. Oh, we, should talk, we should talk about that. Let's um, that right and we should talk about how this is all going to shake out and how it affects global maritime traffic. Okay. So yeah. the first question is, what happened? Okay. Well, what happened is the ship, the largest ship that can possibly go through the canal, it is exactly the number of feet of the maximum ship allowed. But it happens to be so wide that where it got stuck, it barely fits through the middle. All right. Now, the sides of the canal at this point are sheer sand walls. And so as it bumps into it, the sand falls down and it traps the ship. There's other things that were going on at the moment that it got stuck. There was a sandstorm. And it was big winds. And so the sandstorm is blowing hard wind. And this ship, which has thousands, 20,000 containers on it, stacked 13 high above the deck, completely full below. The, 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 all these um, containers act like a sail. So the ship is going through there. The sandstorm is blowing. And the vessel turns, it doesn't have to turn much, and it's stuck. And that's a problem because to unstick it is really difficult. And we're talking about the absolutely most remote place 
like Hawaii is the most remote island group in the world. Well, the most remote place you could get to by water in the middle of a desert is this spot in the uh, Suez Canal, you know, which connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean and the whole history of why that's important. This is the same sea that God split so the Yids could walk through with Moses. I mean, there's a whole <laughs> lot of history tied up to this spot. Okay, and, and so how did they get it out? I remember reading there were three things they tried. One okay. is they try to take the sand, the sand out uh, from under the ship. Another is they try to use tugs to pull the ship off the sandbar. Uh, and the third one, uh, the third one, um, gee, I can't remember what the third one was. That they was- tried, they, they, Which they ultimately did, which is that they raised the water under the ship. Uh, but okay. what's important is that, um, there is a salve war that came into play. And um, you, so they tried to use um, material to remove sand from the sides of the boat, but you couldn't remove sand from under the boat. They tried things like getting rid of the ballast. Ballast is weight that you put on a ship to cause it to go down in the water. So they were pumping out the ballast to try to float the ship. Um, and then they, what ultimately got them out of it is the water power of the canal was used to push the vessel while the salvers were pulling the vessel. Now the company- The salver is a tugboat? The salver is a company that it's, his job is to get it out of there. Now it could be, you know, we've gone over the laws of salvage or ancient maritime laws, they're traditional remedies. They're all around the world and the company has a right to hire a salver and they hired Smith which are the big boys. These are the guys that removed the Costa Cordia disaster in 2012, the ball, and then the Baltic Ace car carrier that sunk in 2015, right at the entrance of the port of Rotterdam. So these guys come in when the troubles are really big. And, uh, you know, so the, here's what actually happened at the very end. They needed two much bigger tugboats. And there were no tugboats this size. Um, at the time, but they, because it's the middle of nowhere. And so they were rushing these giant tugs to get in there because all the little tugs weren't enough to move this thing sufficiently. So um, they, they just weren't around. The physics of what happened is it's a 430 yard long vessel. They had eight tugboats pushing and pulling and uh, there were ships everywhere. There were ships in front, there were ships on both sides. The way it works is that ships can go in both directions through the canal at the same time, but there are these wide spots in the canal in which you move ships over to one side or the other, you let ships pass. All right, and so they were dig they were dredging sand, but it only had a very minor impact. They tried the ballast water to stabilize the ship, and then there was what they called plan B while this was all happening, and they were going to try to inject water under the vessel so that they could blast sand out to try to, un, you know, to get it happen. You know, since it was dislodged, it got anchored at the Great Bitter Lake, which is um, in the midpoint in the canal. There's 25 crew members on board, which is very interesting because they're all na Indian nationals and they're stuck on board. There's a court in the, in the town of Ismalia, which is on the west bank of the of the canal and it's Egypt and they issued arrest orders. So mi mi under Egypt's maritime laws, they allowed a precautionary seizure, meaning they, they knew there was this debt, the debt had been incurred, and so they were allowed to seize the vessel. Um, you know, okay, so, so now stop there and tell me yeah. what that $900 million is about. Okay, well, there's three major issues there. It's the total compensation that they could figure out right now. And I guarantee you that's going up. But right now you've got the loss of revenue for ships that would ordinarily run through the canal. That's number one. Then there's damage to the waterway. And number three, there's the equipment labor that were deployed to uh, deal with this. And now you've got this conflict going on. Egypt saying, I mean, really 900 million, let's round it to a billion. The insurance company can come in and put up a two, like in America, you get like a double or a triple amount. The $3 billion handed over or in the form of a letter of undertaking, they could 
get the vessel out, and maybe the Egyptians would be reasonable and allow it to be decided in Britain, provided they've got their billion, two billion, three billion there held by their courts, but they don't want to do that. Okay, wait, so this, just to square away on this, this is the law of salvage. Anybody that helped this ship get unstuck uh, and the canal for the damage to the canal, um, and I suppose other shippers who were delayed, uh, 367 ships were delayed, it cost them money. Uh, gee whiz, there's a bunch of claims. And I guess all of those claims are included in this 900 million or billion dollar affair. In, but the, the, init in the initial the, thumbnail estimate, but you have, it's, they're not all salvaged. There is cargo interest, 20,000 containers that have an individual contract with the shipper that I told you about that rents the vessel. And there's a contract between those container owners and the vessel, all right? And that, what that is important is it brings in another ancient law called general average. And that means that not only is the ship responsible, but every piece of cargo may have to contribute to it. So now you got a conflict between all the shippers and, and the vessel interest and the Egyptian government. Um, there were 422 vessels were building up after the grounding. Four, they were ready to go through. And just to show you how good this canal has been since they improved it in 2015, that before that, you could only get 46 or 47 ships. Now you can get 97 ships through. They cleared the backlog in three to four days. Now that's not the whole, uh, that's not the whole story because there's something called supply line economics. And supply line economics means that once you knock the supply line, that those, dock, those things that were needed somewhere aren't gonna get there in time. And so all the people that needed it there can't do the things that they need. Like I think there's somebody did an analysis of the Apple iPhone and just one little part, the processor has materials from 46 nations that all have to be shipped by vessels from one place to another. And at the end of the day, you got this little processor. And then that little processor goes into an iPhone and then it's shipped somewhere else. So this all depends on moving stuff around. And right now we've got these really, really difficult supply line problems that could undermine the economy of the entire world. Because this impact, I mean, it's an enormous amount of shipping went through this little space. Um, okay, so now now we're talking about um, you know a lot of legal issues, a lot of claims by a lot of people. I mean, yes. everybody on the stage and the Shakespearean stage has a claim. Um, I guess there's an insurance company that's going to have to deal with this. There's the owners. Um, there's the lessees. Um, certainly, there's the crew. Um, there's the Suez uh, Canal Authority. Right, there's, that's there's Osama Rabin. Egyptian government. Um, it goes on and on. Uh, anybody had any contact with this sh ship or this uh, this this uh, this incident uh, is going to have a claim or be claimed against. So then you have an arrest, okay? And I, I'm hoping that you can explain to the people what it is an arrest. It's, it's an admiralty concept, um, and it sounds like an arrest stops the ship, and the owners of the ship have to. Well, the arresting parties, I should say, they have to take care of the ship. Well, the ship 400 yards long, that's pretty expensive to take care of a ship like that, isn't it? And the yeah. ship isn't in the canal right now. It's outside the canal. No, no, it's over in an area, the Bitter Lake, which is in the canal. It's stuck in the middle. It is not going anywhere. The ship has been detained, it is seized. And Osama Rabi, as a really good spokesman for the uh, SCA, which is the Suez Canal Authority. And he says, look, agree to the compensation and we'll let the boat go out, all right? And that's, you know, that's them being very reasonable. And uh, so that's the putting up uh, of the money to do this. Um, so how, how is this going to get uh, organized? Because this is a major affair. I mean, I presume that these, uh, what did you say, 20,000 containers are still on that ship. 
Oh, they, yeah. didn't, keep, they didn't keep, leave town yet. Oh, yeah. And, Just to and, give you an oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, all that supply line economics analysis you were talking about is still in play. And there's still losses going on at the far end of that trip. And then, of course, the lawyers, the lawyers are coming from, gee, was must be every country in the world because so many people are involved to try to, you know, assert their claims or defend their claims with this ship. This is this is going to be this is very meaningful for the economy of Egypt, I think. And for the economy of the maritime lawyers around the world, because every one of them is going to there's a conflict. So you can only represent one of these parties. Just to give you an idea of what 20,000 20 foot containers means. If you put a 20 foot container on a truck, it becomes 40 feet long. If you had six feet in between each truck, it would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Trenton, New Jersey. We're talking like 175 miles of ship cargo if it was all taken off in that way. And, you know, one of the ideas was when it really looked like a jam, they were getting ready to take the cargo off the ship in the middle of the desert. Think about that. What are you going to do with 20,000 containers? And you need helicopters out there to move them one at a time. And gigantic crane ships. This thing could have been there, you know, for a year without any problem. And it would stop this waterway from functioning. This is a huge problem. And this isn't the only place that you have those kinds of passageways. You know, there's the Straits of Hormuz. There's the uh, Moluccan Straits. There's the Panama Canal. And we are really, really vulnerable to this kind of shipping. And like you said, all those things needed to get somewhere where there's companies waiting for those parts to do the next thing. Right now, we're panicking about we don't have enough computer trip chips to build cars. So those computer ch chips, which are not you know, being made by people that are real happy with us because of the way we've acted in the last five years, and so we're not we're not so we're no longer the high prestige nation. It used to be back five years ago and up until actually almost right now that if you were an American ship, you got to get in ahead of the line in going through the canal. And that's because we've been shoveling uh, Egypt a billion or two billion dollars a year in discretionary spendings. We call it protection. And that's buying this American favoritism which is really the cost of American prestige that has eroded enormously recently. And there's all these other players coming into play. Okay. And so, you know, did you know that at one point after Nasser nationalized the canal, the United States came up with a plan in the mid fifties to blow up about 400 nuclear bombs in the Sinai and blast another canal almost right next to it, you know, 50, 100 miles up the desert. And then we would have our own canal there. And, you know, we didn't go that route, but we've known about this problem for a long time. And this issue goes back to Nico, a, a pharaoh who used 150,000 people to dig the canal the first time in recorded history, according to Herodontus, who is one of the Greek historians that documented this stuff. And a lot of people since then had ideas, hey, let's build a canal through here, you know, including the Ottomans, the uh, Venetian traders, the Egyptians themselves, and finally Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to build a canal, but his surveyors went there and they determined that one side of the canal was 40 feet higher than the other side of the canal. That was a mistake. This is actually a level waterway, but Napoleon didn't do it because he was afraid that if he succeeded, the waters would rush in and flood the entire Nile Delta. Now that was a miscalculation. And then we get our, our homie, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler decided he wanted the canal. So he and Mussolini and his crowd could be the ones that controlled it. And so he invaded North Africa. The British went in there and fought them. It was really about the canal at that yeah. time. A couple, now, a couple of things uh, that, that you mentioned in passing, and that is that this canal has no locks. There are no oh. locks in the Suez Canal. The, the level of the, um, of the Indian Ocean and the level of the Mediterranean uh, are the same. 
And so the ships just just pass through um, without without interruption by by the locks. The other thing is that you can talk about the uh, history of the canal as a primitive canal way back when, but in fact, the current canal was built a, more, a longer time ago than you would might have think. It was it was uh, started in uh, like 1859 or thereabouts. Yeah, actually, uh, I think it's 42, but it's a 152 year old history of the canal, which then got expanded in the, between the years of 2000. 14 and 2015, which doubled the number of ships that could go by from 47 to 97. And the total cost of that upgrade was $8 billion in today's money. I mean, we got people all over the place that got $8 billion to do it. Well, you know, so we only have a few minutes left, and I want to focus on the international implications. And there are two questions I'd like you to address, Jay. One is, <clears throat> is this going to change the way the Suez Canal works? Did the canal work properly? Does admiralty law, as it applies to this, this incident, work properly? Um, is it going to change for the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, uh, to streamline, to use that term, to streamline things? Because after all, we find now that we're dependent on these canals for global trade. They're really important. Uh, are they functioning properly? Actually, yes. And the law is working beautifully. And there will probably be minor tweaks to already existing contracts, but the contract that each vessel signs that's gonna cost them about $700,000 to go through there has been really ironed out. And there may be glitches that we learn about to modify and improve it. The maritime law works wonderfully with great precision. And we're gonna run around and we're gonna bang swords on shields. And at the end of the day, we're gonna sit down with a bunch of mediators and we're gonna to try to figure out how to skin this cat. The canal works great. It is a wonderful source of pride for the Egyptian people. Dignity, pride, sovereignty, which really matters. And it's a source of, of foreign currency and revenues for Egypt. And it's a really a big deal. And how did it get solved? I mean, it's the intervention of the Almighty. This king tide, which only comes about once a year in this time because of the position of the moon, raised the canal water. I mean, it's like the parting of the sea. It floated the boat, and that's what got it moved and, and unclogged this. Oh, well, I knew there was something biblical about this. Yeah, yeah, I'm always trying to rattle that. There book. you go again. Yeah, okay, yeah. Another, another question, last question, really. Uh, uh, the impact of this kind of incident on global trade. You mentioned, you know, the economic supply line analysis and all that. Um, but just suppose we lost one or both of these major canals and uh, these uh, cargo ships uh, would have to navigate um, to the south of uh, Africa or and or to the south Cape of South of America. Good Hope. Yeah, it's the Cape of yeah. Good Hope. And yeah. that's why the canal got built, because the British seized the area of South Africa, created a garrison there, and every ship that went by, whether it was a whaler, whether it was a foreign nation going to attack somebody, or whether it was trade, were vulnerable to the British there. So the French got together with the Egyptians and said, hey, let's build you a canal. And the French paid for it. And the Statute of Liberty that we like to make believe was built for America, it was built to be at the Mediterranean side of the canal, and they decided not to. And the Statue of Liberty was to show that the light of France and the Western world was bringing trade to Asia. And that's where the Statue of Liberty comes from. It was an afterthought because they had this old piece of crap and they couldn't figure out what to do. And we decided that's what America is. So bring us your poor, bring us your everything. And I don't downplay the reality of that sentiment. But the idea to say that she was built for us, uh -uh. she was built to sit in front of the canal as a guiding light to show the Chinese, the Indians, all of what, you know, Eastern Asia, that we were bringing enlightenment to their shores in the form of trade. Yep, yep. Okay, so, uh, so this is very important. Both canals are really, really important. And, um, you know, if you don't have those canals, you have to, you have to go thousands of miles out of your way and, and uh, spend a lot of money, time, uh, staffing, bunker fuel, what have you, to, to get there. It changes the, 
trade paradigm in the whole world if that yeah, happens. Yeah. So yeah. My, my question to you is these must be strategically important. They have been strategically important in the past. So if I were a terrorist, for example, uh, I might try to leverage the importance of these canals uh, because if I could stop trade through there or threaten to stop trade through there, uh, I'd, be, I'd be making a big statement. Um, and do you think that is possible? Has it happened? Oh, yeah. And here's what that's at stake. Here's what is at stake. 12% of the total global trade passes through the Suez Canal. 30% of all the shipping containers in volume pass through there on a daily basis. And according to Bloomberg, 10% of the world's oil trade and 8% of the national gas trade is passing there. It connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. It's the ultimate shortcut from Europe to East Asia, from Rotterdam to China. And uh, the other way around is the uh, Cape of Good Hope. And that costs at least 12 or 14 more days, depending on your engines. And it exposes you to the pirates of Somalia and all kinds of other people who can grab yourself. So it's exposure to security risk and pirates. Yeah, you get it? It's a big deal. And the Egyptians want it. They're not giving it back, you know, and to build it. These guys built it with shovels. There was as a there was a hundred thousand people virtually enslaved to dig it. They were paid nominal money and each, you know, you get it, blood, sweat, and tears. You know where that comes from? It comes from uh, Winston Churchill, who had during the war, but this is one of those blood, sweat, and tears. And that's why the Egyptians were indignant about it. And supposedly the Egyptians auctioned it off back to the uh, British and to uh, the French. And when there was a problem, you know, they seized it as a military control because back in 1940, we understood how strategically important it was. Well, this certainly focuses world attention on it uh, and, and on Egypt for that matter and on all the mechanics you have described and the legal issues you have described. I can see all these uh, young, young law students changing their, their focus to admiralty now. Well, um, it's hard to get paid. That's <laughs> why admiral, and I help people. My job is I like to help people that load and unload ships. I learned this stuff because I was blessed to get to go to this college law school, the Tulane, which I said is a phenomenally you know, important maritime law school the leading one in the world. And we learned this as our bread and butter, but I don't actually get to do it so much. There was once I had to do a general average case in which there was a ship coming into the Honolulu Harbor, the Coast Guard, which you know about said, nope, you can't come in here because it's leaking ammonia into the hold. And so all of the, the cargo in the hold, like very expensive chocolate, got poisoned with pneumonia, which is not poisonous. It just couldn't taste good. And so all the cargo interests had to contribute because the, the one thing leaked, and that was a very complicated case. Well, are you talking about very complicated issues and involving physics, involving chemistry, uh, involving the, you know, the fundamental industrial processes by which the world trades. And people, you know, they go to the store, they buy what they need, they don't realize that it's a combination of, of components from everywhere many of which have gone through one or the other of these canals. Well, thank you for helping us understand it, Jay. It's really a contribution to the public conversation. We should all know and understand what's going on. Really appreciate your expertise and time. Thanks so much. Honored to have the opportunity. Thank you, my friend. Aloha.